Welcome to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kurt Wooler, talking with experts in functional and integrative health and medicine, discussing critical information for improving your health and wellness to help you live a long, full life. Let's get to it. Hi, this is Dr. Kurt Wooler. Welcome to the podcast. So in this discussion, we're joined by a Lynn Weber, who is a certified health coach. And what's important about this discussion is mold and mycotoxins, which is something that is quite more recognized or prevalent today, um, primarily because there's a lot of people who've been exposed didn't know it. And there's a lot of health issues that can come about from being exposed to mold and many of the mycotoxins that mold produces. And in this conversation, we're going to talk about what are some things that happen in the home with regards to mold contamination, mold exposure. Now, this could also translate into an office building where schools many times can have mold problems. And Lynn has her own experience with this and insights about sort of the do's and don'ts, things to watch out for, things to consider. And so a very important conversation. Looking, I've been looking forward to this one for uh, quite a while because this information is really relevant for most everybody with some type of mold exposure. So Lynn, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dr. Waller. I'm really happy to be here. So before we get started, tell everybody about your education, your profession, and then you know, how you got interested in this topic from a, from a deeper perspective. Uh, but, but yeah, give us a little background on your education and profession. Well, as you mentioned, I'm a holistic health coach, and I've um, I graduated from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in 2013. And after I went through my training, I still felt like there were a lot of things that I didn't, you know, completely understand. Epigenetics was kind of becoming uh, at the forefront of conversation, as well as you know, digestive health and um, leaky gut, and I didn't really understand how all of these issues were connected. So I spent a lot of time researching. And after that, my focus was really on helping people in a preventative way, you know, much similar to my story where I was trying to prevent cardiovascular disease because it is a genetic issue in my family. And what I realized is that most people really aren't interested in doing anything about their health until they develop more serious chronic health conditions. And a lot of that is related to mold. So uh, for me, I didn't really, I mean, I was never interested in learning about mold. Uh, it was never at the forefront of my thought process. Um, it wasn't until I resolved other health issues and didn't see a very big change in some of my markers that I started to think, well, maybe there's more to it, something that I'm missing. And I had done a visual contrast test back in 2018 because one of the practitioners that I listened to suggested it and, and I did have a negative result, but I didn't know what to do with that information. Um, I had also done a meta-oxy test, which you, know, you can probably explain more about that, but there's several different, um, it's a urine test and you know, there's several different layers of colors. Well, my result came back at the very highest level of biotoxin accumulation. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about, you know, what does this mean? Is it still related to my oral health? Is this because of mer mercury toxicity? Um, and like I said, that was in 2018. I still didn't really know how to, you know, go about figuring out what it was. But through, you know, doing other tests, I just everything just kept pointing to mold and I wanted to ignore it, but at some point I had to at least consider it. So that's kind of where my story starts. So it's interesting. I go back many years in practice. I was in San Diego, California at the time and really relatively new as a doctor in this world of functional integrative medicine. And I remember having an individual come to me. It was a young woman who was a, you know, she was a professional herself, extremely ill. And my only mm. reference point for the level of problems she was having, you know, she was functional, right? She still worked and whatnot, but just felt terrible, was a former colleague of mine who actually had some chemical exposure 
early in his life. And it turns out that this individual was exposed to mold, docu- documented mold in her condominium complex, and that's when everything really turned south for her. And it affected her from a cognitive standpoint, physical standpoint, chronic fatigue, immunological standpoint. It was really complex. And it really impressed upon me as a young doctor at the time, like, wow, the, this mold exposure is another, it's a whole other thing in, in essence. Mm-hmm. And the difficulty that I've seen over time, and as, as you mentioned up front, is that a lot of people just aren't really willing to address their health unless something really significant happens to them. And the difficulty, and you tell me if I'm wrong, the difficulty with mold is that it tends to involve more than just the mold itself. It's now involving the home and potential damage in the home and and other items in the home. And there's this whole other layer of complexity that sometimes people have to to tackle. So tell us about how you came to discover this issue for yourself um, and then started to realize that it was maybe playing a, a much larger role than you anticipated or expected. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is a, it's, a, it's like opening a you know can of worms. It's where do I start? Is it from an old exposure? Is it from a current exposure? Um, I really was hoping it was only from past exposure, but you know as I started to um, open up more um, ideas about where it could be coming from, and I talked to a practitioner who was very uh, experienced in mold. He suggested that I have my home tested, and after testing, I had very high amounts of, you know, uh, even stacky uh, mycotoxins that showed up in the home. And it was very frightening and intimidating to, you know, try to understand, okay, now what do I do with this information? How am I going to deal with getting this mold out of my home? Where is it coming from? Um, so, you know, and, and I, I did start developing some other more serious conditions. I was having rashes that showed up in different areas of my body. I developed blepharitis, so I was losing my eyelashes. I was having a hard time focusing. I, you know, it was hard to see when my eyes would get all puffy. And so this was affecting me, you know, at a different level than what I had experienced um, previously. So, It was definitely something I needed to look deeper into. After we had that, um, the hurts me test, actually, I think I did an ERMI at first. And, you know, there was that, that detects 36 different types of mold toxins. Um, But, you know, my doctor tried to direct me in, in finding a remediation company, but there was really, there was really a lot to sort through. I, I think I contacted three or four different companies. And of course, not everybody responds to you right away. So I did have three different companies come in and do um, an examination of my home and every one of them did it differently. They didn't use the same equipment. They didn't have the same um, like remedies for what they were going to do once they found, you know, the information and where they thought it might be coming from. They didn't have the same suspicion about my, what might be at the root of it. So there was no evidence in my home pointing directly at any one thing. So that's where it became really confusing. And, you know, then I, I made a decision about choosing one company. Um, and I was hoping that was going to be the answer for me. Unfortunately, you know, after having a low count, the first test after they did the remediation, we I did another test a few months later, and then I had high counts of spores show up again. Okay. So, yeah, so it was a, a long process and very frustrating at, at different points. So let me take it back kind of to the beginning. So when you think about mold, and then you, you have the mycotoxins, and sometimes there's con- confusion, right? So the mold is the organism, and people can react mm-hmm. to it from an immunological standpoint, you just develop an allergy. So you develop like IgE allergy reactions, for example. It might be sneezing, it might be coughing, it might be a rash. And then you can also develop just um, respiratory, what they call mechanical effects, like the irritation of just 
some of the fragments of the mold, just causing an irritation like a pollen might cause irritation in your lungs. And that might, again, might clearing your throat, coughing, just irritation. And then, of course, we know that mold can create an infection. So you can actually get mold growing in your lungs, growing in your sinuses. And we know now, as you've done some work on this, you can get colonization of certain mold within the digestive system. And so you can have an infectious type of presence of mold. And then there's the mycotoxins. And these, this is often creates confusion because many molds produce these mycotoxin compounds. They really produce these things as just to try to create a competitive advantage in their own little microenvironment. But in our body, they cause problems or cause problems in animals, for example. I'm curious, in the early testing you did, um, did you show like immunological reactions, allergy reactions to mold, or did you mostly assess your own exposure through mycotoxin urine testing? What, what kind of testing did you do? So originally, like I said, I did the, um, the, the VCS test, the visual contrast test, which tests your neurological function of right. the, you know, the small vessels in your eyes, um, which like I said, indicated that I was in chronic inflammatory response syndrome, but I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. And then I also did that meta oxy test. And then it wasn't until I had met the doctor that I'm currently working with who he had me do another visual contrast test. And he gave me, gave me a better explanation about SIRS and what, you know, what was all involved there and told me that I needed to take that very seriously. And I think the reason I contacted him was because I had developed blepharitis and um, all of these uh, breakouts in my body. And of course, I know that anything that happens on the exterior of your body is also happening internally. But as far as any, you know, issues with breathing or anything like that, I never really had issues. He did indicate that I had methylation problems with methylating mold because later on I did an organic acid test. I think that was probably in about 2021. So that was, you know, a few years later, again, as I started to, I like experimenting with different tests. So I, you know, did a bunch of different tests that I thought would help me identify whether mold was an issue. So that one did indicate high markers in the yeast and mold colonization. And then I had also done some gut microbiome tests like the Viome and Biome tests. Okay. And they also were indications on those tests that I had um, bacterial, you know, high markers of the, in certain strains of bacteria that pointed towards mold. Okay. So and that those were kind of my indicators. Yeah, and the visual contrast sensitivity test is important. That's been around for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. looking at how biotoxins can affect, you know, the visual system, for example. Yeah, and then obviously a sort of reflection of what may be happening neurologically. And then that translates into the SIRS, the, the chronic inflammatory, uh, you know, syndrome. But we know that other environmental factors can contribute to SIRS mm -hmm. and certainly, you know, create problems within the visual contrast sensitivity testing. So, sure. but, and, and I know we're kind of going a little bit off topic, but I'll, I'll bring it back here. In my experience, Lynn, and, and I'm sure maybe you can, you have your own experience, but when I look at people who've had or have very complex issues, particularly a lot of environmental sensitivity problems, and that could be environmental just sensitivity from a uh, immune system standpoint, auditory, visual, you know, even just you get even out there, even just with some of the electromagnetic frequency issues, uh, perfumes, detergents, there often seems to be a mold component. And so my impression is that the mold and their related mycotoxins are a major massive trigger of SIRS and a, a, one of the major problems in visual contrast sensitivity. Not to sit there and say everything else is benign, but perhaps the mold and mycotoxins just are a little bit more intense in their ability mm -hmm. to affect those systems. Would you agree or disagree with that? No, I would, I would agree. Um, I would say that all of the things that I was dealing with at the time, you know, little, I was having problems with my thyroid and hormones. Um, I had food sensitivities. Um, 
I, I was having sleep, you know, not, not good sleep, waking up a lot at night, kind of feeling um, anxiety, um, depression. And when I started working with my doctor, he said that until I cleared up the mold, that a lot of these other conditions would be hard for me to resolve. So right. yeah, I would say mold is probably at the root of a lot of people's issues without realizing it. So let's bring it back now to your home. Okay. So I'm curious where in your home was mold and water damage detected? Um, <laughs> so we had no visible mold. Nobody could find anything on the windowsills. There was nothing below our sinks. Um, we had some, some of the um, companies that came in, came in with cameras that were like thermography type where they could sense heat and cold and there, there was really no um, moisture detected. There was some small cracks like in the window sills that they said maybe we should be um, taking care of. The one place we did find visible mold, and this was during the first remediation, we found mold in our garage right next to our furnace where the furnace was being vented in. So the final conclusion was that it was very likely in our ventilation system. Mm -hmm. And they did do a duct cleaning the first time around, but I felt, I didn't, like in my gut, I felt as though they didn't do a thorough cleaning. So this time around, we just had the remediation done the last three days of May. Um, they did a more thorough cleaning of our duct work um, more air scrubbing, used um, ozone, um, or they they put the the cleaner through the the furnace system uh, so that they would. I mean, this I use the citrus had them use a citrus cleanser, which I guess neutralizes the mycotoxins. So, you know, for me, from in my case. It wasn't obvious. It, our whole home never smelled like mold. There was n never any presence of mold other than that one area out in our garage. Um, and like I said, we had that done three years ago. So we thought we had resolved the issue. But mycotoxins can be airborne. And there are certain strains of, um, of the mold that if you open your window and it comes into your house, it's airborne and it's living in your house at that point. Right. So I'm presuming that's what happened. So you know, you coming in through the filter. You mentioned uh, Hersme assessment, Ermi. Can you describe the, the some of the the differences between those and and or how they may complement each other as far as this type of assessment goes that people can at least we'll talk about maybe steps and other things, but but in particular those tests. Yeah. So like I said, originally I had the the ERMI done and the ERMI is a um, test of 36 different mold species. Um, and then the second time around, I had the hurts me done. Um, according to my doctor, he can get as much information from the hurts me as from the ERMI. And it's the hurts me is really focusing on five species that are known to be harmful to humans and to affect you know, human health. So the second time around, we had that one done and you're going to, you're going to see whether or not like stackies in your house. Um, I'm, you could probably speak about some of the probably. other aspergillus that was present in, in our, um, on our test, we had aspergillus show up. So yeah. Um, the difference is really one shows five strains or five species and the other one indicates 36 species, but not all 36 are harmful. Whereas the five in the hurts me too are all known to be harmful to humans. And I think that's an important distinction is that you may have 36 detected through ERMI or whatever, not, not all of them have to be there, but you know, there may be an abundant amount, but not all of them, or even you, theoretically, it could be possible, none of them could be molds that are known to cause human disease. So the hurts me mm -hmm. sort of comes into play to say, no, these are the, these are the five that are known, documented in the medical literature. 
to be, mm -hmm. you know, significantly harmful. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Lynn, as well as I do, everybody's reaction can be different. So not everybody's mm -hmm. going to manifest with the same, sometimes have the same issues, um, even people living in the same home. I've seen this in many cases, even entire families where maybe two of the five individuals are affected and the other three are like, I, I feel nothing. And the other two mm -hmm. are significantly impacted. So it comes down to the individual uh, as well. So when you think back on just from a home perspective, because you have a scenario where it's not obvious, right? You find some mold in, you know, out by the furnace, for example, they think it might be in the ventilation system, but it's not like you have any known water damage. There wasn't some pipe leaking in your walls. That was pretty obvious. So what happened, right? So they, they go through, they clean out the ventilation system. Was there anything else done for your home? Did they go into the basements? Did what other types of treatments done to just try to remedy the situation, even though there wasn't necessarily a large primary area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a one-story home. It's on a slab, so there was really um, just the one level. Um, they did a thorough wipe down. Um, as, as much, I mean, anywhere you can see dust landing, it has to be cleaned off. So flat surfaces, anything that there was dust collecting on, books have to be wiped down. I wiped down all of the hangers in our closet, took clothes off hangers, washed them all with the solution, wiped down shelves in the closets, um, wiped down surfaces in our bedroom, beds, um, washed all the bedding. It, it's a pretty cumbersome process. Um, they came through, helped us uh, the arrangement, I, because this is now our fourth time of doing the wipe down, the arrangement we had is they did anything six feet and above and I did anything six feet and below. But I had them wipe down all the books because I didn't want to pull every single book off the shelf and wipe it down. So um, every book was wiped down. Um, all the high surfaces had to be wiped down. So once the wipe down was done, uh, they came through and did they put air scrubbers in the home three different air scrubbers so while they were doing the cleaning they had the air scrubbers running then they took all of the vent covers off washed all the vent covers wiped down inside the vents with the the solution and then through each of the vents they had to run a the vacuum it's a high powered vacuum that runs you know they have it parked on your street and very high powered, like it would suck a cat up. And they literally would suck like they, not that I tried it, but they said that they've had some experience where people's lot lost their coats because, you know, somehow the, the vacuum, I don't remember what the scenario was, but it actually sucked a coat up. So wow. very high powered. And they would, um, they have it so that there's like these little wire streamers coming off of it and they they kind of swirl it around in your your ventilation system you know going into it with the solution and at the same time sucking out any of the mycotoxins that are you know in your system um and then they also have to i mean there's a certain process to it where they have to cover the other vents so that you know the the dust isn't coming or the vacuum isn't coming through there and blowing the air back into your home. Right. So there's a certain process. And then we actually still have an air scrubber running in our home. They let us keep it while we, while we were away. So we could continue to pull any mycotoxins that could be floating around yet from the loose dust that was, you know, surfaced during the process. So we all can collect dust in our home. You know, I mean, none of us want to live in a bubble. So, you know, you open your doors, you open your windows, obviously in the summer and in the fall when it's nice. So there's, there's going to be some dust that moves through. I'm curious, though, in your experience, are there specific home items that seem to be more susceptible to mold contamination? I mean, you mentioned books, for example, and I'm thinking clothing, bedding. Uh, what, what do you have to add to that, I mean, in your experience? Yeah, so anything porous, you know, wood, um, of course, books and, and paper would be porous. 
Um, even leather or suede would be considered porous. All of your bedding, mattresses, your furniture, it's all of it is porous and very likely the molds, the mycotoxins have gone into like deep enough in there that it's not necessarily going to come out if you do some type of a cleaning. Right. So, you know, I see a scenario here. You have one scenario where there's obvious water damage or mold accumulating in a primary spot that is in the home. I had some situations where somebody found stachybotrys behind their washing machine, you know, in mm. the, in the, in the kitchen. Um, other individuals where they found entire walls that had are growing mold from floor to ceiling because of some sort of water pipe break. Um, although it wasn't necessarily obvious until the wall was taken out and sampled. But then you have probably in my experience more times than not is situations like yours where you detect mold. You have some individuals who are experiencing symptoms like you described. Perhaps you pick it up on an organic acid test, for example, where you see, you know, mold colonization markers, or you do a mycotox profile through the urine and you pick up on mycotoxins that way. But again, there's not like a large accumulative spot in the home. And so I, and and Lynn, maybe you can expand on this, but clearly if there is a primary area where there's water damage, that needs to be fixed and remediated. But what you describe is a whole home cleansing. And so I can see a situation, whether somebody actually has a primary area that they know is problematic or just suspecting that they might be based on testing and symptoms, in both scenarios, you you actually really need a whole home cleansing. You can't just rely on fixing the water damage spot. Would, Would you agree? Yeah, unfortunately, that's the case because the mold is growing like it, the mycotoxins are what are spreading around in your house. And anytime dust lands, they live in the dust. That's their way of surviving. Right. And, you know, this seems, well, it is, it's, it can be daunting and overwhelming. Um, do you see, well, I don't want to paint a picture, but do you see a, a situation for somebody who's experiencing known symptoms of mold or suspecting that they have, that there's any other way around this? Or is it just going to lead to continued problems if people just don't step up and say, this has to be handled? I wish there was another way around because I see it a lot in my practice where when people aren't getting the solution or the resolution they're looking for with doing all kinds of other treatments, it ultimately comes down to let's look at mold. It's, it's very likely a player. And when you start telling them or asking them what other things they're experiencing and, you know, have you ever been exposed to mold? Are you noticing these things when you're on in your home? And the answer is, yeah, they're dealing with anxiety or fatigue and they can't get resolution. Um, and then they say, well, when I went back to my mom's house, I noticed that the whole wall was full of mold. And now that I look at my own house, I see that there's mold in my house. So they start taking a deeper look when they're not getting the resolution they're they're wanting with all the other things they're doing. What do you feel are some of the common misconceptions people have with regards to mold exposure? Um, Probably the biggest is that mold isn't a problem. I just, you know, we, we were made to live in mold and so our body will handle it. Well, that might be true to some extent, but if your body's dealing with all kinds of other conditions, which eventually happen if you're if mold is at the the root of it all um, then the body's not able to handle mold and we weren't meant to live in mold for long periods of time sure we can be around it for a little bit and it should be able to handle it but to live in mold I don't think that was ever the intention so um, yeah mold even if people have like my husband doesn't have as much of a problem he methylates mold much better than I do but that doesn't mean it's safe for him to live in an environment where there's mold. 
Right. So that's that's one of the misconceptions. Uh, the other one, I would say, yeah, um, if I don't see mold, it's not visible, then it doesn't exist. Again, I learned that in my case, it wasn't true. And, and those are exactly what I've experienced is that if I don't see it, it's not a problem. Um, or, you know, it's, yeah, it's a little bit, it's not a big deal. And what the other point you bring up is, is very good is, is that, again, what we mentioned before is that some individuals don't really seem to have an issue, whereas others are greatly affected, but it's not healthy for anybody long-term. You know, I often talk about the mycotox test, for, for example. Those are tests of detection. Right? Those are testing for the, for the presence of a mycotoxin. And by definition, based on their chemistry, based on the medical literature and, you know, studies that have occurred over the years, they have toxic, known toxic effects. That doesn't automatically mean that your exposure is automatically causing a problem, but the longer it's there, there's a, the greater p potential that that could create a problem. It's not doing you any benefit. There's only the potential for harm down the road. And the point I love, Lynn, that you brought up, and this is so important, and I want to maybe expand on this part of the conversation, is that very rarely is it the only thing someone is being exposed to. If you think about our environment with different chemicals, from glyphosate to organophosphates to a wide variety of things that we're being challenged with, disruption of our microbiome, dysregulated biochemistry, et cetera, it's not as though this thing is living in isolation, although it seems to be for many people a major catalyst you know, to problems. And I, I'm wondering what you're seeing in practice as a health coach. I know as myself and being a physician now in the, this world of functional integrative medicine over the past 25 plus years, it's, I'm seeing increasing complexity of chronic illness. It's, it's not that it was easy 20 years ago, but there's just much more of it. And I'm finding that for many individuals, a major piece of their problem is mold and mycotoxin exposure. What, what are you seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely noticing that too. Um, I think more because now it's on my radar. So when I said, you know, when people aren't getting the results they're looking for, my mind immediately goes to, it's very likely mold. And most people don't want to look there. Like me, they, they, they don't even want to open up that can of worms. But once they start accepting it and looking into it, the evidence points in that direction. So what are some maybe do's and don'ts from your experience now when it comes to mold remediation, home assessment? What, what are some things you talk about with, with clients that you work with? Well, if, if there's any suspicion of mold, my first thing is always to recommend at least start with the visual contrast test and just see, is that even you know, a player? Is, is there a, an idea that there might be some um, neurological dysfunction going on because of some toxicity and maybe not mold, but at least, you know, if you don't pass the test, you know that you need to dig a little deeper. So that would be my first. And by the um, way, Lynn, where, where, where is that test access from? How do people access that? Uh, if you go to the website, uh, survivingmold.com, uh, that's Dr. Shoemaker's website, but okay. you can get it on there for like $15. Okay. okay. It's a great place to start. Perfect. So the visual contrast sensitivity, uh, surviving mold. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah. Um, I would say the next thing is, you know, find somebody who's experienced in mold and, Maybe maybe there's several people that you talk to, but find out what they did and, you know, what their experience was and who they talked to and who they used for uh, coming into their home and doing a thorough evaluation. So, you know, the next thing would be do an evaluation of your home, whether it's the, the Hurts Me, the Ermi, the Emma, you know, do some um, tape tests, you know, whatever you can do and just find out if there is mold in your home. And then start considering 
where else might I be exposed? Is there something happening in my workplace? Is it something I was exposed to when I was a child? Is it something that I was exposed to, you know, growing up um, in my parents' home? Uh, so just start paying attention to things around you and your past experiences. Look out for, you know, any areas where there might be water sitting around or visible mold. Um, pay attention to, am I leaving my clothes in the in the wash machine after they've been in there for like an hour or two? Because mold's going to grow on those eventually. Um, moisture around the house. Is there mold outside and is that coming in through my windows when I'm leaving my window open? And then be diligent about wiping, you know, what dust your house at least once a week to get the layers off that you could be having potential mycotoxins build up. And and be cautious, you know, protect yourself. If you you don't want the dust flying up in your face where you're breathing it in. So be, you know, conscious of how you're cleaning your house. Um, don't use don't use bleach on mold. Um, that's actually um, what I understand is that can actually create more mold. So don't use um, don't use uh, bleach. But there are other cleaners that you can use that are much more safe and less harmful, less harsh. Um, use air purifiers. We have several air purifiers in our house, so. Um, HEPA filters help clean the air. You know, if there's any mycotoxins, they'll pull some of those mycotoxins in and they probably won't get all of them, but at least they'll get some of them. Um, and then you pay know, attention to symptoms. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, pay attention to symptoms. If if you're starting to suspect that it could be mold, you know, are you fatigued all the time? Do you notice that when you're at your home, or in your workplace that you're feeling all of a sudden drained or you're sneezing or coughing, um, just pay attention to the different signs and symptoms that might be indicators. You know, one of the things you're describing is it's all important information. And what I, what I was visualizing is that you're, you're talking about things too that are preventative, like the dusting and wiping things down and not leaving your laundry sitting in the, the washing machine for a prolonged period of time. These are, so there's the active steps of mold remediation and clearing out, but then there's the preventative things trying to prevent the thing from happening in the first place. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's just, it's like anything else, right? There's always prevention that could be done that maybe just are sort of good standards of care for, for, for your home. By the way, I wanted to ask you, would, if somebody did an ERMI or let's say more sort of like the Hertz me, if those came back negative, particularly the Hertz me, right, for, for uh, the pathogenic molds known to humans, do you mm -hmm. think it's at that point okay to stop, you know, and say, okay, that's good enough, or it really maybe is more individual dependent on other testing they've had done symptom wise. What's your thoughts on that? Well, because it's a very sensitive test, um, I guess the the only reason that you might not be able to de detect some of the mold is it depending on where you're wiping. Um, are you going to all the rooms of the house, you know, other than bathrooms and wet areas, but you want to wipe down at least several spots in every room in your house to make sure that you're covering all the potential areas of risk and, and then do some, you know, testing on your own body, like maybe an organic acid test to just verify that there, there is no indication of mold being a problem for me. What about, you mentioned, you know, one of the challenges is, is with different companies that, that come in. I'm not, you know, we're not necessarily naming names, for example. And, you know, like you mentioned, some of them d use different technology. And as a layperson, you know, like, oh, I don't know what the technology is. You know, how do I know which one is supposed to be best? You know, it gets confusing. So I'm almost envisioning, in, in many regards, getting a couple different opinions from, particularly if you're in a city environment where you have, you know, more companies out there. If you're in a more rural community, you may not have a lot of choices. But you know, and actually getting a couple different assessments and 
impressions, if you will. I mean, clearly, it's obvious if you have a wall that's growing mold, you know, that that's pretty obvious. But in your situation, it's, it's like, well, where is it? You know, is, is, is what's causing the issue, the spot that's in the garage by the hot water heater, for example? So do you advise individuals, you know, that, hey, sometimes you don't always know. You have to maybe try a couple different places to kind of get different perspectives. Yeah. Unfortunately, there is really no standard um, like certifications for mold remediation companies. And I think this is where, you know, they could tighten up a little bit and have some more standards, higher standards for mold remediation companies. Because what I found is that when I contacted several companies, they would say, well, we have a certification in and they would list a bunch of initials, which meant nothing to me. Um, so I had to kind of vet out, well, what does this actually mean? Does this mean that they're better than this company or like this company has this certification? Does that mean they're better? I, I don't know what all these certifications stand for. So it does take a little bit of uh, research, um, talking to other people that have gone through it. But yeah, I think having several different um, you know, companies come in and give an evaluation um, is definitely important, maybe following some of the guidelines that Dr. Schumacher has recommended. I'm not sure what your opinion is about his protocols, but um, I know he has very high standards and maybe maybe a little bit too extreme. So it'd be nice to know that there was a company, you know, or standards that kind of fell somewhere in between. Because I know that the ERMI and the Hurts Me are hard to pass. And and that's kind of the standard that he uses. But there yeah. are the yeah. certific the certification that that um I the the last company I used was the IICRC. Um, okay. Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration certification, which I believe is more of a hospital grade certification. Well, one of the things that I think is really important to people listening to this is is the instructions or not instructions, but advice that you gave up front about being proactive in your own home. Steps that you can take and implement as part of just living in your home to do your part, looking for mold, keeping it clean you know, as best as possible. These types of action steps are, are critically important. Um, yeah, you're going to need some professionals to come in if you've got problems. Probably a good idea from a preventative standpoint is you know, maybe every six months or once a year, even if you have no obvious mold exposure, is have your ventilation systems cleaned out. So you could actually have, you could do a home cleansing, you know, once a year, or every whatever. Depends on where you live and every person's going to be a little bit different. But, you know, we don't all have to just sort of stand by and wait for a problem to happen. It's being proactive and, and trying to keep our environment as clear as possible. You know, the reality is we live in the world and there's mold in the world and we're never going to escape it completely. And this brings me to my next question, Lynn, is in your impression, and I realize this is another spectrum, right? It's not necessarily an all or none phenomena, but maybe for you, and then also perhaps clients that you work with. But in general, how does somebody know when they're done? How does somebody really know when their home is now, for the most part, either mold-free or mold greatly reduced? Is it purely their symptoms? What, what's your impression? I don't know that it's going to be just based on symptoms, because for the most part, I'm symptomatic free, you know, other than the fact that I might have, you know, some hard or some challenges with balancing my, my hormones and some thyroid things that I'm working on. Um, I don't know that symptoms alone are going to give you the answers. I think that until I get a, you know, a low count um, a low mold spore count when I do either the ERMI or the hurts me, I'm not going to feel like I'm done. Okay. And that makes sense. Particularly, and that's why those tests, I think, are important to have as a benchmark, right? There's that, mm -hmm. it's like an organic acid test. 
or a mycotox test or some of the other tests, the visual uh, contrast sensitivity test, you're creating those tests are important up front to create um, a foundation of what's positive, what's negative, and maybe what can be repeated down the road to make sure things are clearing. So it's not just based on how you feel. It's also objective information from testing. And I think both of those two things together are, are critically important. Do you find yourself now having been exposed to mold and having some of the physical issues that when you go to somebody else's home or you go to a hotel or you go wherever, uh, uh, are you pretty sensitive to things environmentally? Um, I don't really react. Um, I don't, I never really had problems with itchy eyes or like problems with my lungs, you know, breathing or anything like that, but I'm sensitive in the sense that I pay attention. And if I see mold in a, in an Airbnb or a hotel, I will tell them that they need to fix it because it's not safe. And there are people that could go into those places that are very sensitive and could have, have a very bad reaction. So I'm no longer silent about it. I let people know that those types of things are nothing to mess around with. Right. What were some things that you did in general to kind of help decrease your load of, 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 ex, of exposure or your body burden, I should say, of mycotoxins and, and mold? What were, in, in general, what are some things that you've done and maybe even continue to do to this day? Yeah, those are great. The, great that you brought that up. Um, I use bioenergetic assessments. I have a, a therapist who um, helps me determine what are the most prominent things that I can focus on in my body for today. This is what my body is struggling with. And then, you know, I use the different um, little tinctures that are recommended and try to get my body in a better state. I also, you know, always test my gut microbes. So I'm doing different tests to help identify, you know, what foods are going to help support my body right now. Is it low histamine foods? Um, it, like I've, I've had problems with di digestion, especially digesting proteins. Um, and I can tell when I'm at that point, you know, when, I've, when I'm eating and within a couple bites, I feel full, I can tell that my digestion is suffering. So um, doing different gut, gut tests. Um, also, you know, blood tests, just regularly having my blood check to see, um, are there any things that are showing up there? Um, hormones, having my hormones checked. I do liver cleanses or like I recently did the rapid liver reset just to help clear up my detox pathways, make sure that I'm able to process everything and clear things out as they're coming through my body. Um, supporting my immune system, all of those things are huge. Mitochondria health. So, yeah, I think it's all important. If my body's struggling with mold, I want to do everything I can to help clear up all these other areas so that it doesn't have to work so hard. I think what you're really describing, Lynn, is that it's a constant pursuit or lifestyle modifications to just keep your body in tune to deal with the exposures that you've been exposed to in the past and will be exposed, currently being exposed to and will be exposed to in the future. Again, we don't mm -hmm. live in a bubble. So it's not like it's a one and done kind of deal. And, and my, my experience with mold is, is that's generally it. For many people, it becomes a a lifelong pursuit of just modifying their lifestyle, improving their health, working on these things, you know, continuously. It doesn't necessarily mean that for everybody, it has to be this massive, intense program. It gets to be, the, but being aware, you're being conscious, you're being more aware, becoming more sensitive to how you feel and just be conscious of it, you know, and that it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. The other it's thing, never, there's, go ahead. There's never an end to it. It's, and I have backed off on certain things at certain times because, you know, being constantly um, like at the top of my game, it, it can be exhausting. So at times, you know, I, I 
rest a little bit, but for the most part, I'm always paying attention to how is my body reacting to what I'm doing. Right. And is that, is that message getting through in your profession, in your practice with patients, the people understanding that, that, that concept, that principle is completely necessary? Um, I try not to talk about it too much because I don't want to scare people away, but that's ultimately what I'm trying to help them accomplish is the sustainability of life. You know, you're not doing anything just for a period of time. It's all about maintaining and finding a balance, finding a way that you can um, eat healthy, but enjoy it and know that it's something you can sustain for life. Right. Yeah. And that's really key. And one of the other things too, and, and, you know, I've seen this over the years is one of the things I think about a lot with regards to particularly mold and mycotoxin is the immunological memory that gets formed in the body. Because it's not just, let's say, a chemical toxin that you can take a supplement for or, you know, detox from, and then it's gone. Because these are, you know, living entities, right? The mold, there is a, a biological evolutionary, you know, standpoint that these things have been around for a long, long time. And so have we, but our immune system has had to recognize and adapt and change in, you know, the context or the presence of these things. And so there is a memory that actually happens in our body to mold exposure. And I think this is why yeah. some people, when they get re-exposed, they get a resurgence of symptoms. It may not necessarily be overwhelming, but there's a return a lot of that can be because there's just an immunological imprinting that happens. And so that imprinting or what's called immune priming, in many regards, never goes away. It it's just becomes a sort of a, a backdrop to the immunological template of our body. And there's just certain realities that for some individuals, they may always have some challenge or sensitivity to, to re-exposure. And... Yeah. Um, Perhaps that maybe is in part what kind of what's happening with you. So any, um, Lynn, any resources that you provide or can recommend for people out there seeking for more information? Um, I think, you know, going to the survivingmold.com is a great resource. I've followed other practitioners um, that specialize in mold, Margaret Christensen. Um, I know Bridget Danner is big into that, but I'm always here as a resource. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to help guide them down the path because it, it is very overwhelming um, and can be a very hard journey to navigate. And what's your website? Um www.lifeinfocusenterprises.com. Excellent. And we'll have those posted on your podcast page. Any, you know, any final words of, uh, of encouragement for people out there listening who are struggling? Uh, any other, you know, you know tips or, or points you want to make before we uh, close out the interview? Just don't lose hope, you know, Again, just follow your gut, whatever your, your gut instinct is. If you think that mold is a possibility, just start investigating and contact somebody that can help you. There's, you don't have to do it alone. There are plenty of people out there that have gone the path and are willing to help you. And again, I'm certainly one of those people. So um, don't feel overwhelmed, don't feel alone and just be helpful. Right. It's a process. Like, like everything else, it's, it's a process of investigation and reaching out for help. So, Lynn, it's been, been great to interview you. Great information. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Waller. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk podcast with Dr. Kurt Waller. For more information about this podcast, go to functionalmedicinedoctalk.com.